Let's do it now. Turn up the volume nice and loud. Because we are controlling transmissions with dance beats and r and You're in the mix with Lil Drummer Girl. With your host, Dawn Marie. Hello, my lovely drummies and drumettes. Welcome to another episode of The Little Drummer Girl. Today, we have a super special guest. His name is Lawrence Lipone Redding. He's an award-winning vocalist, guitar player, voice instrumentalist, storyteller, songwriter, author, teacher, and traveler. He is best known for his one-man orchestra show, simultaneously playing, singing, and making the instrument sounds with his mouth without the use of a loop pedal. He incorporates a full spectrum of musical styles from American roots and jazz to throat singing and Indian classical. Native from the farmlands and beach towns of coastal North Carolina, his mama's soul, boogie blues, and disco records had him interested in music, art, opera, books, and theater, and he often dreamt of traveling to exotic places. And at the ripe age of 21, no longer able to be contained by a small town, he escaped to New York City and discovered improvisation, comedy, jazz, modern <laughs> art, dance, and performance art. We have so much to talk about with Mr. Lip Bone Redding tonight, so let's get him on the air. Hey, Lip Bone, how are you doing this evening? Hey, 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 how are you doing? That was a cool introduction. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You have <laughs> such an amazing background. I don't even know where to begin because I can't believe how much you can do. It's just amazing. Yeah, I'm um, a man for all seasons, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, when I saw you live at uh, Kathy's house a few weeks ago, I was just blown away by your talents. And not only as an awesome songwriter, because I thought your songs were, like, amazing, but the storytelling, which, by the way, you just had me in stitches. You're so funny. <laughs> and then the sound Thank that you. you made with your mouth, well, you know, I, I, I just was blown away. So <laughs> let Thank me you. ask you this question. How uh, young were you? Started doing music. Well, I guess when I was five years old, I took some piano lessons, and I guess that's that, that's probably a good start. I didn't really stick with the piano though. It was that um, you know that uh, what do they call it? The Suzuki method, and it's it's, it's hot cross buns, hot cross buns, da 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 da. You know that one Mississippi, two Mississippi hot dog thing. <laughs> yeah, it was that thing. <laughs> you, know, you had to bring your parents with you when you took the lessons and did the recitals and. I remember my oh, mother at yes. the time, yeah, she was wearing a wig, and uh, I don't know why. She thought it was the fashion or something, and she was wearing this wig, and that you have, when you do the recital, you have to introduce your parents and say, hey, and I said, this is my mom. She's wearing a wig, and then I <laughs> played this, you know, and then I <laughs> played hot cross buns and Mississippi hot dogs, but, you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> it sounded like you did a lot of traveling, and then you ended up in New York, and you were playing in the subways. With you were actually playing on, in the station that I used to travel back and forth to work every day in Soho. What was it? Oh, no kidding. Yeah. yeah, spring and the yeah spring on the number six train. You know, I, I I was working as like a carpenter, doing a bunch of crappy jobs, things that I didn't want to do in New York City. I hear you. And then it, my hands started to get all messed up, and I was like, oh, I got to start figuring something else out. So, yeah, I took to the streets. Nice. So you were able to make a living just doing that performance every night, every day. Yeah. And you were able to survive. Yeah, I like the first That's time amazing. I went down there, my my friend Tofu. His name is Tofu. He asked me if I wanted to go down there. And he said, uh, said man, you should, you should do it. You'll make some money. I was like, I didn't believe him, you know. So we went down there. And, and he kind of taught, taught me a couple of tricks, you know, where to stand and how to stand in front of the people and how to play, whatever. I don't exactly know. Not how to play, but, like, just some tricks, whatever. And cool. we played, and I, I made some money the first night, and I was hooked. It was like a drug, man. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> if, if I can make, you know, 60 bucks in a couple of hours, I don't need to go get a job. Like, That's right. So, That's right. Yeah, I just kind of. In a couple hours. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That's how yeah. that happened, you know. That's awesome. While you were playing down there, did, did you ever come across anyone, like, maybe from the industry that might have, like, said something to you or try to get your record deal or something? Did anything spur from that? Oh, lots of people, man. Isn't that the problem, though? It's like everyone says they're going to do something for you, and then at the end of the day, you just have to learn how to do it for yourself anyway. Even if people do do stuff for you, it seems like. So I had so many people say, oh, man, 
want to get you on my record. I want to introduce you to this guy. I want to do that. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, out of it for for every you know twenty of people who said something like that, maybe like one person, you know, you get a free meal out of it or something, right. <laughs> something like they that. Actually so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. you know, uh, but mostly just the the kindness of strangers was really that's what blew my mind more than anything. How you know, New York has a reputation for for being really rude and harsh and cold. And it, and it can be, you know, honestly. Mm-hmm. But as an artist, as somebody who's just kind of bearing their soul, deeply public place, intensely public place, and making yourself vulnerable, I was really surprised at how wonderful and warm people could actually be. Just people on their way, you know, like yourself, back from work or wherever. Can I uh, can I put a side note on there? They yeah. probably weren't New Yorkers. <laughs> yes, no, no, no. It's interesting. No, no. The people, the people who were the the crappy ones were the ones who were not from New York, and really? the, the, the people who were yeah, the people who were working every day and working down in Soho. They kind of got they kind of got to be a regular crowd for me because I see the same people and they'd ask me how I was doing and what I was what I was up to, and then wow. so. I started, you know, form relationships. I'm a very kind of, uh, I'm a, a people person, as it were, because I really believe in that kind of a connection in an artistic sense, too. So, I it, I don't know. It, it, it keeps me in a certain place, I think, as an artist in terms of, um, you know, I'm not really going after the big fame thing. I'm just going, I'd rather go for people who really care I want to be involved in whatever it is that I have to offer. So I I think that that kind of dictated the shape of my artistic career from there on out. I I, that's what I'm trying to say. That I mean, that's that's really great because I think, especially your storytelling. Because I mean, I was feeling the things that you were talking about, and and you have like this great way of explaining things that I could just see these visuals when you would say these words and, you know, you're describing certain situations and it was just like, like I was there. So you're a great storyteller, but you perform over like 200 gigs a year and you travel by, by your van. Yeah. And, and so how, Uh how do you keep your, from your vocals from burning out? Because, um, can you give us a little sample of or after you? <laughs> sure, <laughs> you're like, like, you know, blah, blah, blah. I could go on uh, and on all, all day. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on for hours, but anyway, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit for you. Thank you. But how do you how do you keep your vocals from burning out? Because that's a lot of strain on the vocals. Uh, well, the first thing is I I don't party like I used to. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's I that's one thing, um, and I don't smoke anything. But that no. doesn't mean I. Well, I don't know what I can say. It's a podcast, I guess. You know, I, <laughs> you I guess I enjoy <laughs> cannabis as much as the next person. I just don't smoke it anymore. How about that? that you know, <laughs> I try to do healthy things too, and I, uh, I, I've turned into like a vegan. I didn't want to say it, like, because I don't want to, you know, want to be one of these, oh, you know, these militant vegans. I'm not like that or anything, but I just, I've just tuned my life to uh, around the music and around knowing that I'm going to have to get in my uh, beautiful flying machine, which is what I call my van. Oh. And I'm going to have to take off in the springtime and head out on the road and, and be circumnavigating the country for almost an entire year. Wow. And then I got to take care of myself. You know, right, you got to, right. you got to do that. You got to think of the long term. I mean, when I was younger, I didn't think of the long term. And now I'm thinking, Whoa, you know, this is, <laughs> I, you know, I, this is all I know how to do now, and I'm, I do it pretty well, and I've kind of got my stuff together. I, I, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to do it. So I don't want to hang on to it. Uh, yeah. How old were you, say, were you when you actually made that decision? Oh, ah, probably in my 30s. Sometime, yeah, you know, early thirties, maybe. It's that time, like you know, party days. Okay, we got to put that aside, and, and that's yeah. That. <laughs> we only have yeah, one temple, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I. This is true. I, 
it gives me the most thrill to make music and, and to once you've hit it a couple of times you know once you've hit that that like sweet vibration in your life uh, where you know you you played the best show and the people are all excited and everyone's happy and you're happy and like the flowers are blooming and the, it like all happens at once sometimes right and once you're there you got to drink it in and kind of remember what it's like and I, I feel like I'm always trying to get back or maintain that standard somehow like this beautiful moment in my life and if I can like string all those pearls together and have as many beautiful moments as possible to me that would be a full life so mm-hmm. I, I don't know it's, it's not really anything other than a striving in a way I, I want to be feel good and clear and I want my artistic you know, I, I want my vocabulary to come through. I want the words that I and the music and the stories that I have to tell to come through uh, without the filter of being, you know, fucked up or something like that, I guess. <laughs> right. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, or having a fucked up voice, you know, and, and mm. which is cool sometimes, too. You kind of go roll with it. You get sick every now and then, your voice. Uh, you got to drink a lot of that. Um, I, I drink ginger and honey tea or something Yeah, yeah, like that's that, great. That ever happens. Yeah. My singer in my band, when we were playing, um, he would often, you know, get some throat issues and, uh, you know, we'd be playing in bars and it gets kind of loud and he's singing over that and, and with the cajon, it just, you know, it's, it's funny because you, you don't realize until like after it's over, then you're like the next day you have no voice and I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> I'm not I noticed that sing, singing with the band takes a lot more um, out of my voice than, than doing solo stuff, which... That might be another. I just real. You just triggered it, man. That may be the reason I do. I love the solo show so much. I don't have to fight. With yeah, I think so that much. was my, what he said too. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. It's like your own. voice is God, save it. You know, God, why not, man? Yeah, God, yeah, yeah. Uh, you had six albums that you created. How did you record those? Are those like recorded at home studios? Or are they in the studios? What do you? Mm, what's your? I've had like? more than than six. I had like you know. But I had six on the, the last label that I was on with, uh, with B-Pop Records. And so I had a couple before. And when I was in the subway, I put out a new album every week, man. You know what I mean? I don't know what that <laughs> means. but yeah, like, That was the beginning of my DIY career. Uh, yeah. But, um, <laughs> the well, you know time. what? Don't laugh. I mean, look what Stick Figure did, right? I mean, he was making all yeah. the things in his home, and then both, he's like selling hundreds of thousands of, you know, downloads and stuff. Yeah. I mean, now it's like everyone just makes music you know, for them. I hope for themselves. Uh, but just by themselves a lot. Uh, but, uh, okay, but back to answer your question. So the six albums that you're referring to, I did those, um, I did those while I was on the uh, the B-Pop record label, which was with Jeff Eirich, and he was also my bass player. And he'd been in oh. business for years. And so he was a very seasoned, um, is a very seasoned, old school record industry type of guy. Like He's got very, um, very knowledgeable about the way things have been done up until recently. And even now, you know, he's, he's very good in, in a in the music business end of things. So we had a good collaboration, and that really helped me a lot. And I learned a lot from Jeff. Because he's produced a ton of stuff. He's produced like that. Oh, like the Born in East L.A. with Cheech and Chong album, you know, oh, some of the yeah. more famous stuff. He's produced the Blasters. He's produced, um, he's worked with, uh, I think he's produced T-Bone Burnett. Like just lots wow. of people. He's been in the That's business awesome. for Anyway, so how we did it was I rented, basically, I, even though I was on a label, I ended up paying for everything myself, which is kind of how no way. it's done these days. Well, yeah, because, I mean, the more, you got to you gotta think about this. When you're making a record, the more you invest, the bigger your cut of the pie is. That's true. You, you know, and yeah. that's the, that's the thing where, like, there was a time I got offered a deal from Universal Records, and they basically wanted to pay me, like, a lump sum up front, and it sounded like, oh, that's a good, you know, that's 70 grand or something like that. 
Oh, man, Which that sounded like, great. <laughs> yeah, hello. I, oh, I was ready to sign the thing, and I just <laughs> talked to my lawyer friend, and he was like, don't do it, man, because once you do that, they own everything, and if you want to put out a, any kind of a record or anything, you'll have to pay mechanical royalties stuff on your own music it was like a and big that's thing. crazy so, yeah i know they, they, they can really twist those paragraphs around when you see a contract i mean i used to do the music publishing deals and i would look yeah. at some of them and say how did they sign that <laughs> like, that's they what that my lawyer said he's like don't do it don't sign it and so i figured out you know that if i were to just kind of um hire everybody that i could because i i'm a working musician you know so i i'm actually make music for a living and now i'm playing six seven nights a week and, and this was in new york let's say that going back to the first record with b-pop that was uh 2007 i think and i was playing already every night someplace you know and so i had income i was able to pay the band and we were you know i could rent studio time so basically i just assembled a team of like uh, I hired uh, Steve Rossiter at Actus Down Studio, and this is we're just talking about the first record, but it was kind of the model that dictated the the rest of them. I had the band. I hired Steve to be an engineer, and this was when he was over in Midtown in New York City, and it and like the whole neighborhood was under construction, so we would have oh, yeah. to work between like. <laughs> Brrr, brrr, of the, the oh jack my you God. know, schedule like late night sessions and stuff like that. Right, uh, they the, won't be like, working. <laughs> yeah, you could feel it in the like the whole floor was shaking and everywhere. Oh my so, gosh. so, so Which, needless to say, I was able to get a good deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like you know, you got to cut me a break, right? So that's when you got to get your <laughs> New Yorker out. You know, like, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you That's right. I, I, I can't deal with this jack. You're going to have to come here to do No, but everybody was cool. You know, it's also like people were on board, too. You know, everybody really, like, enjoyed the music, first of all. That's really important. If you if you can find people to work with that really enjoy the music that you're making, it, your life is going to be so much better. There's nothing worse than being in the studio with somebody who's like, oh, you know, behind the board. And <laughs> it's like, dude, I don't want to work with you, you know, or, or whomever it is. Um, so anyway, love this which, thing. Oh, um, yeah. Which studio was that? Access Sounds in New York. And then, um, so that was on the first record. And then I ended up, I ended up hiring the Powderfinger Promotions up in, uh, they're in like Framingham, Boston area. Okay. And they, yeah, so Dave Avery up there, he's he's really good. He's been doing it for years. So, uh, and and they did a radio promotion. And you know, radio promotion is like there's like two packages. You know, you can do one yourself, right? Where they just send you the label, and that's it. And you just pay for the mailing list, or you could hire them for the. Uh, to do the uh, radio campaign is. And so, I mean, it was really expensive. It was like $1.50 to send each CD that you're already buying. You know, you buy, you make the CD. This is back when, you, you know, we were still making CDs. Had to burn CDs, and yeah. You burn the CDs, take the take the, the wrapping paper off the CD for a <laughs> and stick the unwrapped CDs into the envelope, stamp the envelope, and this is you're talking about seven hundred to eight hundred thousand. And then you go down with you know the post office with the big white boxes and mail them all off, and then wait. And then then your job is done. So then David Avery or Powderfinger would take over and start calling you. You get uh, you know he's got relationships with radio stations around the country. And um, I'm only telling you this because it really helped me with my touring. And I think I caught it's still done, but I think I just got the last bit of daylight with old radio. And then you look at these reports that come in every week, and if David is doing his job, which he, he does and he was, you see that, uh, oh, KDHX in St. Louis, man, they're playing your song like three times a day. And then there there's a bunch of stations in Colorado that are doing the same thing. And so then what I did was I got on a plane and I went out and I visited all the radio stations. Ah, smart. Once again, smart. Yeah, yeah. Well, once again, we're back to the personal relationship thing, the art. 
that go together. So I wanted to reach out and know, I want to know who's playing my music. I really did. I was real curious. I became lifelong friends with some of these folks, too. That's amazing. Well, I mean, it is. It's like a miracle. But it's also, it was so easy. It was just like, okay, I'm just going to go do it. And our, but see, you made your I mean, minds up to do it, and you, you set that goal. And I think a lot of people, maybe they hesitate because they think, oh, I can't get into that radio station. They don't know me, and who am I? Or, you know, they start having that little bit of self-doubt, which could really stop you from doing something that can just change your whole life around, especially to reach your goals. So you took the initiative oh, yeah. and, and just did it. Yeah, and it's not to say I have that same trepidations as well and the same fear and the same... So, right, but yeah. the difference was is that you did it. You you, yeah. you faced the fear and you did it anyway. Even if you were fearful, you still did it. Well, I, I okay. kind of have a policy also. It's, I think it started back in college when they kept asking me. They said, what are you going to do if it doesn't work out? What, do you have a fallback plan? I was like, well, I do. I'm going to fall back on my ass, and then I'll, <laughs> take it, and I'll, I'll figure it out from there, you know? So, <laughs> right. You okay. paint your, you know, basically, my advice is paint yourself into a corner and then try to figure a way to get out of it. It's awesome. <laughs> you learn a lot. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> so how, are you ready for the 11 stroke well rapid fire interview? I am. Okay. All right. Fix, fix it. I love it. <laughs> All right. Rapid fire. Boom. Rapid Here fire we go. Interview. Okay. Seven. Uh, Vegan. Avocados. Avocados. Any particular way? Uh, avocado toast, and actually the ones in Zuatanejo, Mexico, that they, they call it, uh, oh, God, what do they call them? Anyway, whatever, I don't know what they call them right now, but they put it on a, a piece of French baguette, and they mash some mm. beans in there with them and put some onions on top. I love that. Ah, that them. sounds delicious. I may have to Molletes, 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 I think. Be si muy bien. Mm. All right. Your favorite travel spot. Now, I know it's a tough one because you're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Okay, rapid. And this is supposed to be rapid fire. I, well, the first thing that comes to mind, my mind, is uh, a little town in Colorado that I'm not going to tell you because I don't want everybody this to go secret. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah secret. It. Secret town in Colorado. Is it the Garden of the Gods? No. <laughs> no yeah, that's it. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> that was one of mine. <laughs> uh, oh, it's beautiful. Right. You know, I was walking in the Garden of the Gods one day. Sorry to interrupt the uh, rapid fire. Scene. I was walking in the Garden of the Gods one, one day, and I heard this. I mean, I'm like the only person out there and climbing up this mountain trail, and I hear like a bagpipe. And, I, and, I'm, like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, shit, I, I must investigate, you know. So I'm walking up this hill, and I come around this corner, and it's just like boulder, and underneath the shadow of this boulder is a dude with bagpipes. And he's no just way. waving out here in the wilderness. And I'm like, <laughs> I said, yeah, that's what I, I was like, well, another imaginary friend. Great. <laughs> nice to meet you. No, but he was real. He was, he was, he was a bit surly as like, he was like kind of angry that I had disturbed him in his solitude, but eh, you know, just, whatever. He ruined his day. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. He made mine. I ruined his, whatever. <laughs> Story of my life. And you know what? <laughs> When you left, he had it back. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> like, okay. Oh, yeah, it is beautiful. I remember climbing, what is it, the uh, where they have, like, the saints up on the top uh, of... Uh, uh, are we talking Rio de Janeiro or Garden of the Gods? No, no, oh, there's okay. one, no, there's one in Colorado uh, in Denver somewhere. I can't remember what it's called, but you climb up... Oh, Cabrisi, Francis de Cabrisi. There's a statue. Mm-hmm. You climb all the way up. I was by myself, and and I'm walking up these steps in the forest there, and all of a sudden I'm hearing, like, a rattlesnake, and I'm like, and then I see a oh. sign, you know, beware of rattlesnakes, and I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I like, I'll get bit by a rattlesnake up here by myself, and nobody will find me, and they won't know where the hell I am. But um, who, will, who will suck the poison now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where were you when I needed you? <laughs> so, That's it. All right. I'm sorry. Let me get back to our rapid fire interview. Oh, right. Um, rapid fire question. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Your favorite genre of music to listen to when you're not playing? This week, it's uh, Ethiopian <laughs> pop music from the 1960s, and I'm not making that up. I really Pop music from it. Ethiopia from the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it really a genre? I'm, I'm... <laughs> wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, there's a um, there's a dude. His name is Tillahun Jisese, and he, aka the voice of Ethiopia, and mm. I can't understand he he I can't understand a word he says. But on all his his records, it says there's a little stamp that says explicit, you know, like an advisory <laughs> stamp. I'm like, that's good. I like it. I already like him, you know, and <laughs> I like him more. And so yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So that's that, that, that. okay. That's, 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 that's a true thing. That's, so th- right now, yeah. I, I that, my favorite music. Now is uh, yeah e- Ethiopian pop music from the pop 1960s. Music from 1960s. I yeah. love it. I'm yeah, gonna have yeah. to check that out and see what that's about. Yeah, you really should. You really. Well, I will. It, you know, I, it's 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 fascinating to me. Like I, I've got this weird theory about the 1960s, not just in the United States, but also around the globe. Something happened, and you know, you have all these these cultures that had this sort of. Uh, explosion of expression and or like a renaissance, like look at Iran and then there was a lot of these sure. countries in Central and South America and all over Africa, and, uh, West and Central Africa, there was these like, um, they, you know, people were like getting hip and getting free and getting wild and get, and finding their own mode of expression and then something happened. I mean, you know, some say, oh, well, maybe it was, you know. In some, it could have been the you know, hallucinogenics perhaps. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it could have been like fundamentalism or whatever, but then, but something happened, like something weird happened, and now it's, you know, well, maybe it's kind of all went back down. into the dust. Maybe. Right, and they sprinkled <laughs> some, you know, magical shit on us, and it was like, woo, here we go, let's have a good time. Yeah. And maybe that's it's, why the party would last for 10 years, you know? It could be, yeah, it could be. It could be. Maybe it was just the, the globe waking up, no matter what. We're like, well, and then we hit the snooze button for a while, but now we're going to, you know, we got to get up eventually, man, because shit's got to get done, you know. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yeah. You what can said I say? It. I said it. News button. You heard it here. Wake up. Wake up, people. Right. Wake up. That's what I say when I'm driving. Wake up, you sleepy people. <laughs> yeah. Just sitting at the oh, it's just me. Okay, yeah. I'll just curl up here with the steering wheel for a second. Don't mind me. No. Yeah. Don't do that. Do not do that. Okay. Do not do that. No. Pull over and take right. a nap, people. Okay. Favorite person I got to it. hang out with. My favorite person to hang yeah. out with? Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, that's a tough question. I hang out with myself a lot. So I'm thinking, um, well, <laughs> there's <you>. a, uh, <laughs> I really like hanging out with Michelle in, um, in Eastern North Carolina at her, uh, hippy dippy, uh, shop downtown. This place called the Sojourn, cool. and she's a very spiritually knowledgeable individual. And we laugh a lot. So yeah, that sounds good. I mean that that you know that's a that's a tough one because I I relish my social life, and so there's so many people that I like to hang out with. But I'm gonna say that one today. All right, moment. cool. Uh, yes, you're, you're. I don't. I can't deal in the absolutes. You know, I. I, I never got a no, tattoo there's no because of that. There's no such thing. I wanted to get a tattoo. I really did. I want. I wanted one so bad, but I. I kept. I'm like, ah, I just changed my mind, man. I don't know. You know, I, I That's just, exactly how I feel about them. Yeah, I, I never did, got one. Like, oh, you don't have one either. That's interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. like. I know, probably so, the last person on earth that doesn't have one. Yeah, only me, you know. We, it's like, I feel like I, we missed out on something, but then... Uh, I know, but then I'm thinking it's painful, so I don't know if I missed out on anything. So, <laughs> just, like, all right. so let me get this straight. You're going to take a, a, a needle dipped in some kind of charcoal fluid and embed it under my skin repeatedly for the next, what, day? Yeah, what, uh, and then i got to live with it for the rest of my life? Okay, mm-mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> no, no, I got. I, it's not that for me. It's the, the whole tattoo thing with that. Like I said, I really think it's my own inability to uh, to commit to like <laughs> one idea for the rest of my life because I realize what you know. My I'm like everything changes for me so exactly. fast. My perspective. I've grown so much in the past a few you know twenty years or whatever. I've Nothing is like I thought it was. God, that's proof enough, right? Yeah, like and it's how wrong I was about everything. <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> like, <laughs> what were we thinking? I don't know. I know. I'm just gonna like 
do what I do and just like try not to like be you know that guy and just like do whatever I, it is that I do and <laughs> and, and, it works. and try to be really yeah. good at it and that'll be it you know that's good enough exactly all right one thing that you can't leave your home without oh yeah well it's tough too because you know I live in my beautiful flying machine but I'd say my guitar I, t- I travel everywhere with my guitar and uh, I've been talking to this dude and I really want one of these travel guitars uh, the, the, the the ones that are made out of like carbon fiber. Oh, I saw and, that. That yeah. I was like, could that really work? <laughs> like, really? Yeah, I tried one. They're amazing. They're really good. And are they heavy? Are they light or? No, they're super light. They're made out of. They're lighter than um. So it's like a tennis racket. Lighter than <laughs> than wood. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, the, in the commercial, the guys in scuba gear playing it underwater and shit. Uh, <laughs> no way. Uh, ah. Who knows? But yeah, that, that's what they do on you know on the video. But I can't hear it, but I see the guy like ah well. And then he comes <laughs> up to the surface and plays it again, and it sounds totally in tune. I'm like, oh, oh wow. huh. I, well, that happens to me all the time. I really need to get one. Of <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is it called? Uh, let's see the uh, the the one that I really there was one that I tried and I think it's called a blackbird and, but there's a couple of good companies out there that make them now um, like Emerald makes a good one McPherson makes one um, I, uh, there's one called uh, the journey journey guitars I think it's called journey guitars so cool. they, they make the one that actually that. comes apart flips so yeah it's cool Wow. I, 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 I want one. I need one. Be awesome. <laughs> I remember. And I want him to make it in a nylon string, too, because I, I mostly play nylon these days, and that's just because that's what I like. I don't I go through phases. Like I said, I can't commit to, like, one thing for the rest of my life in, in, in artistic. I don't think we're supposed to. I mean, I don't really think we're supposed to. I agree with that. I don't now, think God gave us today, all these I, options and choices <laughs> to just be bored and stay and do the yeah. same thing day in and day out. All right. So I, I, I got a little with. depressed just thinking about that. Go ahead. Keep going. Let's move on. Let's keep this river flowing. Keep keep this train going. I can't stand right. it. Rapid fire. Favorite Rapid pastime. fire. My favorite pastime? I, yes. I keep an art journal. And you I really too? love to. Yeah. Oh, I love my. I love my art journal. It's, Are they great? Uh, yeah, really good. I find out a lot about myself, and I, I actually, when you, there's something magical happens when you have ideas that are in your head, and then you get them outside of your head, and then you mm-hmm. look at them. There's something really magical about that, and so whatever it is, it could be anything. Like, oh, I don't have any artistic abilities. Like, you don't have to. Just put put it out there. So. Yeah. It's funny because I, I keep, like, a notebook by my bed because sometimes I have dreams about fashion designs because I love designing clothes. And even though I don't oh. sew, I just have all these ideas. <laughs> and I keep saying, right, right. I make a lot of money. I'll have other people make them for me. But I'll wake <laughs> up and I'll just do these sketches because I took some, you know, uh, fashion sketching classes at FIT. Oh. It's just so much fun to be able to put that, like you say, to put it down so that, A, I don't forget what the heck it was because I wake up and I'm like, oh, or a great movie scene, like a, an idea for a movie. <laughs> I'll just, like, write yeah. this stuff down. Do you know Peter Beard at all? Yeah, of course. Yeah, with sure. yeah. Yeah. Did you ever see his journals? No. Oh, my gosh. Wait, maybe he I had... I can't remember. No, no, just let's say no. I haven't, yeah. Well, in Soho on Worcester Street, he had a building there at one point. It was probably yeah. in the 90s. He had he exhibited all of his journals and he had these creative journals visual journals from all of the time that he spent in africa while he was there like he kind of took a hiatus from the fashion photography business there and so he inspired me to start doing those creative journals and i just loved it because you know when you don't have time to write sometimes this is the greatest thing you know you can cut something out and it's like almost like a vision board as well because you can put anything in there oh totally uh, it's amazing right yeah, I love it, love it, love it, love it. And I always say to people, you know, you got to create one. you got to do it because half the times we always say, oh, we didn't do this, we didn't do that. And then you look in there and you say, oh, shoot, I really did do a lot, you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you don't feel so bad about, you know, thinking that you didn't do what you wanted to do, but you realize that, oh, shoot, I really did do a lot. Yeah, I look at mine and I go, oh, man, somebody's going to get rich one day, man. They're going <laughs> to they're gonna post. Like this. This, no one's supposed to see this stuff, but that's what makes it so good, you know. 
<laughs> They're gonna go back. What was what was up with this guy, man? What was he thinking? Of? <laughs> or not thinking? So tell us if you could be reincarnated as anyone or anything. What uh-huh. who would it be and why? Well, first of all, before I die, I want to know who it is so I could leave all my money and belongings to that person, and uh, wow. then I'd come back as, as uh, yeah, I'd probably come back as as lip. Lip bone 2.0. I, <laughs> I love it. And then, and then you know, I make my way. When I come of age, I'll make my way to a secret safe deposit box, and there's all the lip bone 1.0 stuff in there. <laughs> and then I, you know, and aha, the the journals. Here they are. Oh my God, it's like a mystical tome. Maybe that's what I do. I don't know. That's and you buried them in the garden of the gods. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And who's this mysterious bagpipe player? <laughs> this is the point in your show where you really should play some bagpipe music. <laughs> I think I will. Okay. okay. <laughs> There's something very rousing about yes. bagpipe music. You know, I was actually yeah. in the bagpipe band for a while. Together. You were not. And, uh, yes, I was. I'm Irish, and although I don't look like I'm Irish, <laughs> but uh, yes, and I did, and it was so much fun. And um, I used to have to ride my bike because I didn't have a car, and I was in Brooklyn now, in Flatbush, and in the snow, drive my bike like five miles <laughs> to just get to the rehearsals. And it was a bit of a drag, oh, yeah. so I uh, stopped doing that. <laughs> it was just like, I'm oh, going to kill myself for drums. Yes. Well, I uh, see somebody recently. I saw somebody, and they had a guest on stage, and it was a guy playing the bagpipes uh, on a unicycle. And I was like... <laughs> That's That's rock and roll, man. That's full power right there. I love this. (laughs) (laughs) I wouldn't want to fall with that pipe. (laughs) Yeah, no. But Uh, you didn't ride a unicycle in Flatbush, did you? No, no. I'm just checking to make sure it wasn't you. you. I know. I did sit on one when I was in New Orleans once back in the 90s, but I don't know how to ride it. (laughs) Ah, New Orleans. Very cool. Yeah. Such a great town. All right, well, let's get back to your All right. fire interview because it's one more. So interview. rapid. It's so rapid. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, right. go ahead. Your favorite guitar company. My favorite gu- guitar company? Yeah, Maker. Maker? Yeah. Well, I'm really, I'm really a fan of the uh, – I love my Cordoba guitar a lot, and um, uh, I, I really like that guitar a lot. <laughs> it's a, you know why because it's a it, i could it's affordable I, I i don't like taking a really expensive guitar on my travels around the world and stuff i really don't because I'm, i'd be too afraid to, to uh, take it on you yeah smashing it you know like once i was in india and i was um uh hiking up in ladakh which is up in the northern part of the Himalayas, up, uh, almost to oh, wow. Afghanistan, Tajikistan, all of like the top of the world. Wow. And I had this, um, and I was just going for, you know, like a 10-day trek up into the mountains. It was really hot. And I hired this guy to bring, you know, like food and all the stuff. Cause there's nothing up there. And he had a, a, a donkey. And so I put my guitar on the back of this donkey, and I just have this image of this thing going, flop, 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 uh, You know, I watched the, the ass of this donkey, you know, for, for, for a week and a half, you know, bouncing my guitar around. And in the end, it was just like a mess. It was like, ah. You know, it was all like everything was like, yeah, that, it wouldn't hold the tune. It was like, oh, gee. Wow. So, but I've done similar things with my Cordova guitar, and it's super light, and I really like it a lot. So, um, awesome. and, and that never happened. You know, it never went out of tune. Um, so I love it stayed it. in tune very well. Yeah, I like it. So, there you go. Boom. One thing that no one really knows about you, like your close friends, they don't really know that about you. Oh. God, I think everybody knows almost everything about me. Um, life is a public circus, pretty much. You know, it's like anything you want to know, you find out. Um, well, probably one of the things uh, that I really like um, to read science fiction. I'm sorry, That's you cut three. out there. Did you say science fiction? See, I, it was never supposed to be heard. <laughs> no one's supposed to know. 
<laughs> How did if you see? It's a, yeah, I like that. Right. I like I like that. I said that. I did. I'll say it again. I I really love to read like epic, like thick science fiction space opera cool. science fiction, like uh, stuff that takes place. Uh, you know, it's usually a book. It's about like three inches thick, and it it starts out on somebody's story, and then it takes place over thousands of years across multiple galaxies. You know, there's they're singing and dancing maybe sometimes. Anyway, I, whatever. <laughs> that's, that, I, that, that's what I love. I love it. So, and also, I'll tell you another thing. When I'm doing my art journal in the morning in my beautiful flying machine in the parking lot of the pilot rest stop, and you <laughs> see me in there with the windows closed, I'm listening to opera. Really? Uh, you a big opera uh, fan? Yeah, I love opera. Nice. I really do. I'm, I'm really, uh, Can you sing it? Yeah, that's about it. Wow. <laughs> that was intense. I, I, you should see, yeah, I know. It, 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 sorry, it's intense. I'm an intense okay. individual. I have yeah, intense I thoughts. <laughs> <That's great>. <laughs> <laughs> and intense feelings, okay? That's cool. That's cool. It's all good. <laughs> and I like to write in my art journal as I'm listening to opera. I've been listening to M. Butterfly. Wow, La Boheme is going to be here next week, uh, next month. Oh, I really want to go, but I don't. I, don't I love it. Yeah, I'm a big Maria Callas fan. I love her. I, oh, she, yeah, she's she my favorite awesome. singer. I think. Love her. Very and cool. she's beautiful. And she's just, I, don't, uh, I don't know. Do you have a favorite movie? Uh, uh, I really like The Fifth Element. That's good. One. Love that. That was yeah. Bruce Willis. Yeah, Bruce Willis yeah, and uh, Bruce Willis. actually Luke Perry who. The oh, who just passed? passed away. Yeah. yeah, he was he was actually in it in the very beginning. Uh, oh, I don't remember that. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was like part of the archaeology team, and the you know, and the, and the guy goes, "More light, Aziz, more light." <laughs> and the, <laughs> Luke Perry was in that scene. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that reminds me of a scene from. I don't know. I was thinking Rocky Horror Picture Show for a second, but it was actually the Frankenstein. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's closer to my life, really. Yeah, I think I'm doing Fifth Element, but really, what I'm doing is Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, that's you. You hit it on the head right there. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> I've actually got really yeah, big, that's... big boots on right now, and I'm and, and <laughs> funky makeup. <laughs> Did I'm you wearing ever a go dress. To, uh... <laughs> I think it was still gone. Oh, no, late 90s it was gone. Um, Hendrix's uh, studio there, Electric Ladyland. And Electric Ladyland? Yeah, Electric Ladies. Yeah, Electric Ladyland. Electric, uh-huh. yeah. Isn't that? Yeah, Electric Ladyland <laughs> like, studio. That's it. I'm that's questioning the one. myself now. I'm like, is that it? I don't know. I'm um, pretty sure that's it, yeah. Yeah, I went there like to see like the Kings play there once, and um, but they were playing the theater next door on 8th Street there was – the original home of the Rocky Horror Show, and it was so great. Uh, and I, I think they stopped doing that, but it was it was awesome. The good old days, yeah. The good old I'm days, sorry. yeah. <laughs> Let me just go nah, back to the last good, question. You know. Yeah. Oh, the last, last question. question. Okay. All right. Last question. Uh, your biggest pet peeve. My biggest pet peeve is usually, um, and it's really my my own fault I'm pretty sure it's like I always expect people to take music and the music biz and all that stuff as seriously as I do and then when they don't I get really like bent out of shape and I shouldn't I've been doing it for so long you know it's like that whole follow through thing yeah it's like oh you know it's like oh, yeah, hey, look, we're going to get you here. We're going to do this stuff, and you're going to be here, and everything's going to be, yeah, we got it. We'll get it all worked out. And then, you know, you call them, and you're like, oh, yeah. No, nah, man, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that well, is my I biggest pet peeve. <laughs> yeah, I can yeah, do don't that. Do I mean, that, don't do that, man. Do oh. Yeah, yeah. Did oh, I like... did I offer you a false expectation? <laughs> oh, me, oh, my. <laughs> yeah. So, I just, you know, well, actually, I kind of learned to, like, I don't believe, like I said, what was that thing? It goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. Like, one out of 20. (laughs) Yeah, all right. One out of 20 people will come through. So I just, uh, because I don't like to disappoint people either. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's why I say, I think the fault 
may be my own because I like I'm a I like to please people. It's natural for you know as a musician as an artist. I want I want people to be happy uh, through my art. I'm not that kind of artist where I want everybody to feel my pain. I want everybody to feel my joy. Your joy. You right? know, so <laughs> yeah. I, I want to share that you know with you and or your friends or whoever, whomever, whatever, and. I think that, um, you know, when people don't follow through on what they, you know, what they promise, then it really kind of peeves me. Yeah, it's a bummer. I mean, because you're setting up people. I mean, I always say, if you don't mean it, don't say it. Or if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. Because people, like, they may have good intentions when they're saying it. But they set up people's expectations and then, you know, you look forward to something and then you have disappointment or if you're counting on someone, especially when you're counting on someone, they say, oh, I'm going to get you that van and help you move. And then it's like, oh, right, right. was that today? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah. Well, you just, so, you know what, you just actually made me realize what my even bigger pet peeve is than that. Oh, it's somebody okay. who, who will not say, like somebody who said, who won't just say, I don't know. Like they, you know, you know what I mean when you ask somebody a question and they don't know, but then they try to make some bullshit up because they don't want to seem like they don't know. I I've think, had people give me directions that they didn't yeah. know, but they gave me them anyway. Because <laughs> they don't want to feel like they don't know, and, and, and I would rather just go, I don't know. No. Exactly. And or I would rather somebody just tell me, Hey, man, I, I wish I knew, but I really don't know. Uh, maybe you could ask somebody else who actually knows. <laughs> exactly. That, if I if I would have gotten that oh, my man. whole life, and my, I, I would have gotten so much more done. That's probably 10 years of my life has been following people's, you know, hey, man, well, if you just go down here and take a left and then turn right, and then right behind <laughs> on the other side of that thing, you'll see a flashing sign, and inside there is where you want to be. If I would have <laughs> just not ever listened to that shit and gone like, you know, and they would just follow your path. <laughs> yeah. You'll figure it out. <laughs> I probably would have been a lot better. Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for playing the 11 stroke while rapid fire. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> what do I win? <laughs> What's my prize? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so tell me something. You have. You also teach, and you have these classes, which makes me say, I want to do this one. I want to teach this one. This one you call for the children called The Sounds We Make. Oh, yeah. That sounds yeah. so much fun. So you teach them yeah. what vocals and rhythm and sound making? Yeah, it depends on their age, too. Sometimes I just give them a concert, and I get them to sing along with me and stuff. And then oh, sometimes we do, uh, we do things where we – you know, it's like we kind of incorporate sounds into a story, and we do like a story time thing like that. It Very works with cool. adults, too, by the way. <laughs> Everybody wants to sing along and be part of the action, usually, unless they don't. Yeah. And that's a real bummer, man. But, you know, then they I can't shouldn't be that. at the show. You know what I'm saying? That's They're in the right. Show. <laughs> They're They're in the yeah, they, should be, they should be at church or something. One of, those real, one of those real boring churches where they, they're not allowed to do anything. Yeah. It should be home sleeping at the wheel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, you should be sleeping in the parking lot of the Walmart. Go. <laughs> and then you also teach the, it's called the sonic prana. Am I saying that correctly? Well, it, it's actually called om prana, om prana sonic meditation is what it's called. Ah. Uh, yeah. So and, you play, how do you, how do you teach that? How does that go? Uh, well, it's, you know, teaching is, is it's more like leading a, a class or leading a workshop. And we do a lot of breathing uh, exercises. Uh, that's how we start um, with pranayama, which is prana is, is life force experience through the breath more than likely. And then um, there's a, so it's, a, it's a, the yoga of the breath. With that. Oh, okay. And then we, we chant a lot. We do a lot of, and I say chanting, it's like toning, but I use the, the sacred syllable of Om, which, mm, according to, uh, you know, the, the, the Vedas, it contains the entire universe and all of creation and the cycle of life and death is contained in that one sound of Om. So we, we focus on that, 
And then I, I lead people through a series of exercises where we do, uh, it's like chorusing. And so these really beautiful coral landscapes occur. They, you know, they pop up like a field of flowers, you know, by the time we're done. It's really beautiful. Oh, and, wow. That sounds and then, And that's just the first 45 minutes. And then the last 40 minutes of the workshop usually is what, what I call a sonic meditation. And basically everyone, it's the, it's the easiest yoga class you've ever been to because everyone just <laughs> lies on the floor, and, you know, surrounded by pillows and blankets. <laughs> and too good to me. <laughs> it's awesome. We burn some incense. It's, uh, you know, we dim the light so, you know, nobody can see the person who's snoring. Mm-hmm. And uh, usually one person snores. I don't know who that person is, but they've been following me. It's me. It's me. They've been following my <laughs> workshop for, for years now. Uh, no, it's, it's really beautiful. And, and so I, then I, I kind of do a guided meditation, which is, uh, and I play music. And I, the music that I draw upon is um, from the Indian classical tradition, usually, nice. but it's got a, a little bit of a, uh, you know, kind of a Western modern thing sometimes. It just depends. And I talk. Are you playing music with I, your guitar? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I usually do, um, I tune it differently and I use uh, a, a tambora, which is a tampura, mm-hmm. which is like a drone. Instrument. And sometimes nice. I play the flute. I play the bonsari as well, which is an Indian classical flute. And cool. I, I use a lot of scales that are not traditional Western scales. Wow. Do yeah. you read music, or is this something that you yeah. do playing by ear? Or? Yeah, but this is uh, this is mostly stuff that I've kind of are, are come up with already, you know, like like a scale or a, a, a musical world or palette. And depending so you on the actually day, depending, the music that's that's being played. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm playing it, and I'm. But then what I'll do is I'll I'll um, fuse it somehow with uh, like Vedic um, mantras and chants. Nice. So, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm not. I, I'm going more for a spiritual experience rather than a um, religious, you know, religious, religious thing, too. You know, it's not like ah, oh, this is some religion. It's not that. It's just more. It's the tradition that I learned when I, I lived in India and I studied with um, a teacher there. So, oh wow! How long did you live in India for? A year. Nice. Which and part were you I, in? I travel all over. I started out yeah. in Mumbai, and, and this is my first trip there. I started off in Mumbai, and then I went to the south, and I went to Goa, and then I went to uh, Varanasi. There I met a, a teacher uh, named Balaj, who <laughs> was the character, and he's also an instructor at Benares University. And so basically I just ended up sitting with him every afternoon uh, for a few hours. And so cool. Part of the family a little <laughs> bit. And then, yeah. So, you know, it's a nice. very organic experience. Speaking of traveling, you have something coming up in 2020 that sounds pretty exciting. Um, I think yeah. you call it your Backpack Guitar Project. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah, Backpack and a Guitar, it's... Um, it is an idea that I had because, you know, I travel and tour for the past 10 years in my vehicle and on plane, hotel, stuff. So backpack and a guitar is, once again, the theme of being more personal with my art. It's where I'm just traveling with a guitar and a backpack, and I want to go around the world. And, you know, I, I stay at people's homes. I work in... Uh, art centers and community art centers and do community projects. And I just want to uh, sort of document my travel and document my process of um, interfacing it, you know, communing with the and, and as I go, and I literally want to go around the world in a circuit. So 
And that sounds enlightening. Yeah, uh, is there any yeah. way that we listeners out there can help with your journey? Sure. You can go to backpackandaguitar.com. So uh, backpack, B-A-C-K, B-A-C-K, and a guitar, G-U-I-T-A-R.com. Uh, or go to lipbone.com, and you can make a, a donation there, and you can sign up for a uh, subscription uh, to, to follow me. I'll be doing a lot of um, broadcasting and things like that. So. Oh, that sounds exciting. I can't wait. I'm definitely going to make sure I put all of that in the show notes. And speaking of which, um, so you have lipbone.com. Are you also on sh- social media that they can follow you on? Yeah. If you go to lipbone.com, uh, you'll see all of my social media there, uh, okay. Instagram and Facebook, um, Spotify, Pandora, all the usual suspects. And awesome. I'm on iTunes and Apple Music, uh, like a YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. So there's tons oh, that's of wonderful. I'm going to put some of your well. videos up there because that night when I, was, when I saw you, um, it was pretty – pretty dark and I didn't have my, my camera that I usually take with me to shows because I was kind of off duty. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, um, I went and then I'm like, I have my little iPhone and I'm like, okay, but it was kind of dark in, in that Zen zone that she had there. And so the film I took didn't come out that great, but um, I will definitely put some of your links to in the vlog so that I can uh, put that in there as well for them to see you live because you guys, yeah. it's something else. you got to check it out. It's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Yeah, I, I, if, you go to, if you go to lipbone.com, there's tons of videos there and links to videos there. Awesome. Um, I, you know, I also do other stuff, you know, like uh, like I make a lot of, like I, I don't make CDs so much anymore, but I've been making a lot of books lately. You know how people are like, oh, let's do download cards, but instead of that, I've been making all kinds of interesting other items that you can use. And uh, I like to write and tell stories, a lot of art stories, my little books. So you're making the books, and are you selling them on the website? Uh, No, only at the shows. People come, Uh you know, uh, because, like I said, they're all handmade, and they're all, I could do a limited run of, like, you know, a couple hundred, maybe. And then... Yeah, and, and then they're different. And so they're all, like, right now I'm doing some, it's called uh, Further Travel of Exotic Tales. And it's, it's kind of a promo for the backpack and a guitar uh, idea and cool. tour. And so, yeah, and, and, and it's, a, it's a book that folds out into a map that tells a, uh, a, the tale of the time I, I hitchhiked from Bulgaria to Copenhagen. What? <laughs> With my backpack and a guitar. I know, right? Oh, I live wow. a wild life. Yeah, and so, I don't know. I just, this, I just, this is one of those experiences. I just want to share it with people. And so that's what I do. That is I, stunning. I love it because thank you. you don't hear many stories like this anymore. And, you know, it's just, it's so unique to see that people, you know, that they could still, you know, that you are fearless, that you will just, you know, go as you please and, do what you want and, you know, get it, get your, get your art out there. And, uh, I, I just, I think it's amazing. So yeah, I hope person to person. I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you were going to say no, something no, really important. No, I was just going to say, I hope you listeners out there will go to lip bones, lip com and actually help him out because you know what? We all got to stick together. And if we all pitch in and help each other out, this world will be an amazing place. So do what yeah. you can, even if you can only donate a dollar, every penny counts. So yeah, that's all thank you very much that. in advance. Oh, you're that. welcome. Thank you. For well, Mr. Here. Lawrence Lipbone, our time is just, it's <laughs> actually, kept, we are way over schedule, but hey, we're having such a good time. I hope our listeners are going to enjoy this because you know what? Life is fleeting and we got to take advantage of it while we have it so let's just enjoy it and have a good time that's my motto right on move away from the things that make you unhappy move towards the things that make you happy that's right (laughs) and i want to thank you again for taking your time out because i know how how important your time is and thank you for being here because (laughs) i don't know how you do everything you do 
But I really appreciate you being here, and I hope that you'll let me know when you're back in the Tampa St. Pete area so that I can catch a, another show because I didn't get to see the entire show, which really bummed me out. So Ooh. I was only there for like the first half of it, and then I had to go because I had another commitment, and I didn't know I was going to be there. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, thanks for being there when you, as long as you were. Yeah, I should be back in that area in December. I Very think. cool. So. I'll put it on the calendar to remind myself and then maybe catch up with you and uh, get some live footage and add it to the vlog. To your right show. on. All right. Thank you for doing what you do, too. This is great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. It's my pleasure. And I want best eleven you... best eleven questions ever. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was definitely one of the most fun rapid fire interviews I've done yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to say, and I'm sure my listeners will agree because that was a lot of fun. So thank you again. You are. And to you drummies and drumettes out there, thank you again for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoy the show, but also. I want you to know that I have this audiobook coming up, and it's called 151 Musically Inspired Secrets to Master This Thing Called Life. And if you go to littledrummergirl.com, that's L-I-L drummergirl.com forward slash book, you can sign up and pre-order it now because it'll be coming out in a couple of months. So hopefully you grab a copy now because I know you're going to enjoy it. Don't forget, it's never too late to begin to live the life of your dreams and leave a trailblazing behind you. So lock on and lock out, and I'll catch you on the flip side.